Hello and welcome to this very special interview with David Sylvian, which we bring you in association with Eden, FreeServe and Virtue TV. David, welcome to the World Wide Web. Perhaps as a preliminary question, do you do much online yourself? Very little. Just basic communications. But you don't, so you don't see this as a sort of future way of getting your music to more people? Um, that depends what the future holds for me in terms of uh, um, how I'm working and who I'm working with. I see, yeah, I see the potential, for sure. But I don't, but right now it, it doesn't necessarily um, interest me to that extent. Oh, we can talk about your future plans later. We've had a large number of questions from fans from all over the world. Um, sorting them is difficult, but we've got a good one here, I think, as a starter from Darren Hardy, who said, does David have an extensive collection of unreleased work? Is everything and nothing, obviously your latest compilation, CD, double CD, a one-off experiment, or do you expect to go back to other unfinished pieces in the future? Well, I don't see it as an experiment. Um, there was a fair amount of unreleased material lying in the vaults, and I, I really thought this was an appropriate time to get to it, um, for a number of reasons. Um, primarily because the industry is changing, there's no real security um, when working with the major labels. I've been with Virgin for 20 years, but whether I'll be with them three months from now, we don't know. So um, let's say uh, I, I was not to be with them in, in, in three months from now, I would no longer have access to this material at all. And as the material was unfinished, it would never be released. So basically a lot of good material would, would have been lost. Also, I would no longer have had access to my earlier work, the, the back catalogue, um, in all probability. So I thought this was a, an appropriate time to, to, to get to grips with all of that and, and, and really um, bring to completion some tracks that have, I thought were, were quite important and certainly worth a listen. You know, um, They were by no means substandard tracks. They were either not included on the, the albums that they were um, originally uh, meant to complement, uh, because of time and budgetary constraints, or because of uh, conte contextual uh, uh, problems, but I, I really felt that they were that they were strong pieces in the, in and of themselves. Um, are there any more tracks? Um, one or two. Um, I would like to do an instrumental compilation at some point and uh, represent that and uh, create an overview for that uh, branch of of my of my work. So this is really to showcase, obviously, the vocal side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've had a number of questions, understandably enough, asking people why you've chose to actually rework quite a lot of the tracks. There's one particular question from somebody wanting to know why you'd re-vocaled Ghosts, but you hadn't actually reworked the instrumental track. I didn't want to interfere with the with the, the music. Um, I purposely didn't add anything. Um, didn't overdub on the tracks outside of the uh, vocals. I didn't want to take away from the original tracks or to change the, the basic mood of the pieces. Um, I sang the songs as I, as I re-sang certain songs um, as I felt that I could bring more to those compositions now than I could back then, both technically as a vocalist um, but also emotionally, particularly a song like Ghosts. And, um, I wanted to create a greater continuity throughout the album as a whole. The vocal style has changed over the years, and so I, m I made a decision to uh, re-sing anything that was recorded prior to, um, let's say, 84, that, 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 that I decided to include on the album. You've often talked about Ghosts as being an important sort of landmark in your, in your career. What did it feel like to go back and actually substantially redo it like this? It was very satisfying, actually. Um, technically, it was interesting to, to be able to clean up the track, to, to remix the, the piece in the way that, that, that brings it into the present time, um, to re-perform it for the reasons I just gave. Um, it brought me back in time, when actually physically standing there with headphones on performing the piece, um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that I found pleasantly nostalgic, surprisingly, <laughs> much to my surprise. Uh, uh, so 
that that was that was nice. That was I found that a lot actually going back over the older material. There was uh, to relive because actually I don't do this. I actually don't go back and listen to my own work. So it was often listening to this work for the first time in many 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 years, and it was a it was an interesting experience. It's not something I want to relive. Um, I think this is you know not something I'm going to do that often in life. <laughs> I'd much rather be working on new material, but as a one-off, it was really informative and a kind of a bittersweet experience you know because after all this is this is representative of the best of my work so to speak for the past tw 20 years of my life and you look at the work and you say well does it justify that 20 years of my life of course it doesn't I mean I even if I'd recorded Sergeant Pepper or whatever it wouldn't justify all the, that effort, your work never does when you look back on it. So it's this bittersweet experience because there's also something of worth and value there also. But it never justifies that amount of time, that much of your life. It can't possibly live up to that. Let's pursue the thoughts about um, certain aspects of your past being pleasantly surprising that you touched on there. We've had a number of questions, one from Michael Munro, another from Luke Huige, um, both speaking about the Rain Tree Crow sessions. Michael Munro wants to know if there is any more unreleased material to come from those sessions. And Luke says, any plans on reuniting even for just one record with the other former Japan members? I found Rain Tree Crow, who says, an amazing though vastly underestimated album. Are there any outtakes? He asks again. No outtakes in the Rain Tree Crow sessions. Um, no likelihood of there being another Rain Tree Crow album either. Thoroughly enjoyed making the one that we did make. Um, relationships were damaged as a result of, you know, certain unforeseen circumstances that arose towards the end of the recording. Um, but now there's, I think, that there's no um, ill feeling between I any one of us. But there's also no real desire to to reunite, and and uh, I think. There's so many. I work very slowly, as is obvious, and um, I have many ideas for for different kinds of projects, musical projects that so often get pushed to one side in in favor of the the, the one that currently grabs my attention. Um, that I just don't know that I'll ever have enough time to to you know to to cover all the ground I want to cover, um, to actually go back and 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 work with. You know, older setups is, is, is less inspiring than trying to create new ones. We've had a linked question from a chap called Bradley Shelbourne. He says, would you ever consider doing another full-fledged group project again, like with Fripp, he says, and then he again mentions former Japan members, but I suppose following on from what you said, do, you, do your thoughts turn to yes. getting out on the road again? Is that what he implied? Uh, he wants to know whether you'd ever consider doing another full-fledged group project. Yes, I would. Getting out on the road again is, a, is, a, is another ah. is another question. Um, yes, I, I like the idea of working within the context of a group. I really would enjoy that under the right circumstances, and it's something that I always keep in the back of my mind as a possibility. Um, it could be in the context of a live performance, but it would be far more interesting if it was a, 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 a recorded project of some kind, something studio-based, for me anyway, initially. It could then go out on the road. Um, and how but do those live performance isn't out of the question. Right. Either, you know. How do those collaborations come up, come about? I mean, is it random phone calls? You happen to bump into someone somewhere, or I mean, it rarely it happens like that. Right. Um, generally, it's that that uh, either something has surfaced in my work, an avenue that I want to pursue, um, as is, as was the case with Hogashukai. We'd worked together on Brilliant Trees. We felt that there was something, some chemistry there worth pursuing. Um, same with Robert, really. Um, but generally, um, when I'm working on a composition, it, it's when I get to the point of uh, arranging a piece. The arrangement will, will cry out for certain voices, you know, um, obviously within my own frame of reference. But uh, uh, so, say a piece like Brilliant Trees, I heard. John Hassel's trumpet when I was creating that piece, when I was arranging that piece. It's a matter of making those connections and if I make those connections I f believe, and it's, it's, it's proved to be true, that 
if that musician is willing to take part in the recording process, he'll make a connection also. If, they ma if a musician makes a real connection with a piece of music, they'll give you a, a, a committed performance. And that's really what I'm looking for. So this is much more intuitive connections rather than bumping into people in yes. bars and parties. <laughs> well, good for you. Um, you mentioned that this album, these two albums, focus on your vocals. We had an interesting question here, a question I've always wanted to ask actually from B. Hamill. Interested to know if you've ever had any vocal training since your Japan days as your baritone, he says, especially, or it might be she, especially on the low notes is extraordinary. Never had any vocal training at all. It it's just, just matured, happens. yes, <laughs> with uh, time and not, not an awful lot of effort. Time, though. <laughs> and practicing? I mean, do you? No, I don't practice singing. Um, when I'm not actively writing and recording, I'm, I'm, I'm generally not singing. Do you sing to yourself? For I sing sake, or with my children, yes. Ah. We had an interesting question from somebody, I can't quite find it now, asking what do your children listen to? What, are they, what is their taste in music? Um, my youngest listens to bhajans, which are a form of Indian uh, devotional music. Very simple, uh, very repetitious, so she thoroughly enjoys those. Um, my eldest daughter doesn't have a... a, a a large interest in music at present. I mean, she enjoys uh, playing the piano a little, but um, but she doesn't have a, a particular interest in music or a genre or, or favorite artist. And do you feel it's part of your parental responsibility to lead them to certain places? Absolutely music? not. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 they hear a lot of music. Music is played in the car as we travel around. Um, they absorb a lot of music. Um, I mean, you you won't really know until they're older just how they how they absorb it and 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 um, how will it affect how to, how it'll affect their tastes, musical tastes. Um, one hopes, you know, it will it will give them a, a fairly broad knowledge of music because we play an awful because well, we Ingrid and I have um, pretty broad tastes. We've had a lot of people asking you <coughs> about the relationship of your music to your spiritual beliefs. Um, somebody who simply calls herself Patrick says your music's always been inspired a place to reclude, a safe harbor so to speak from the trivialities of everyday life. How in your life are you able to remain inspired? Also which would you feel is most important, the fulfillment of personal artistic vision or marriage? Either or. <laughs> well that's a, there are several parts of that question but the um, dealing with them in turn. The, um, this business about a place to reclude, which Patrick um, refers to, is that how you see your music? I hope that the music encourages um, introspection, yes. Um, I hope that it would, it would be a place where people feel far, far freer to open their own hearts. I mean, you could say the desire is to open open the hearts with music, you know, to, to blow them wide open so that they are vulnerable to themselves. I mean, so much of our daily existence has to do with us closing up, concealing ourselves from ourselves. So if um, we come into contact with something that opens us up, that must be seen as something that is, that is valuable. So um, that would be the primary object, I would say, and from that point onwards that they would feel secure within themselves, within the embrace of the music, within the embrace of the work, to take a closer look. And maybe it would affect the quality of the kind of questions they might ask of themselves. I think that's the, the absolute most you can ask for.